a new day, a day full of surprises and miracles. Sadly, <coughs> Reverend Andy Barnett, our guest minister, fell ill and could not be with us. So one of the miracles is that my husband graciously stepped forward to help. He would not say step forward. He might say conscripted. <laughs> Nevertheless, here he is. And all the team has pivoted to make this moment possible, reminding us that when things go sideways, together we can have a resurrection. Let us worship together and resurrect as you can on your feet for hymn number 38. Morning is broken. Good morning and buenos dias. Uh, my name is Gabriel Palmer Fernandez. I want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us for the first time. We invite you to take a blue packet, which is on the welcome table by the door. In that packet, you'll find a yellow card, which we hope you'll fill out so that we can stay in touch 
with you. We also invite you to join us for coffee and refreshments after the service, where we'll be happy to answer questions about church activities and programs. We offer religious education classes for children and youth, and child care is available for children five and under. Kathleen Hogue is our Director of Religious Education and can answer any questions you have about our program. There are no additional announcements. Oh, thank you. It's not in the program. I, I just see you there. Uh, uh, would you mind standing up and sharing that with? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, we're flying by the seat of our pants today. I haven't looked at this yet. It was given to me uh, on my way here. <laughs> I carry a pencil so I can edit as I go along. Thank you for your patience. On to the chalice lighting. This is Easter, as you know, marking the anniversary of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the promise of eternal life. Recently, a friend's father died, and apparently YouTube heard the news. Since then, there has been a steady feed of accounts of near-death experiences. I watch these credible people, people of all persuasions, not religious or righteous, altogether credible, talking about seeing their loved ones, talking about going through a long lit up tunnel full of love, talking about landing in a garden of paradise. I like that. Then, true to my UU spirit, I get skeptical. I chalk it up to residual electric activity in the brain, maybe. Blended with a little hormone dump, oxytocin, maybe. Christianity is the first of the world's religions to franchise the whole heavenly afterlife idea. On top of that, Jesus refers to God's heavenly kingdom over and over again. But it's never clear. Is this heavenly kingdom in the future or in another place, afterlife, or is it in our midst? I often wonder, what if the heavenly kingdom were in our midst? There's an old children's poem called The Land of the Sugar Plum Tree where all the world is made of candy. That, that is paradise in your midst. Oceans are frothy milkshakes, homes made of gingerbread, and trees shedding sugar plums into our laps. Over the rainbow where troubles melt like lemon drops, that sort of thing. That's, that's a good paradise in our midst. Similarly, the Buddhists talk of something called the Pure Land, a kind of Christian kingdom of God. They promise that if we free our mental clutter, all our delusions, the world is, in fact, paradise. Me, I have a long way to go. Sometimes I'll travel the snowy streets of Youngstown and think, oh, they're sprinkled with sugar, heavenly and then it rains, and the gray, and the cracks, and the long shadows return, and sometimes internal battles go along with that. Perhaps paradise is all in the perspective. I cherish those visions in my mind's eye of my girlfriend sliding in a home plate on the ninth inning, or my husband here paddling his boat by my side and the water sparkles all around us. Or right here now, I hear the birds outside these windows. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. 
We light this chalice for your own form of paradise. We light this chalice. New candle, by the way. I invite you to rise as you are able and greet those around you. I encourage you to especially say hello to those people you may not know well. So before I do the story today, I will do the announcement. Yes, there is going to be an Easter egg hunt. And uh, just to be clear, we are not hunting for corn or refried beans this year. We are actually hunting for eggs. <laughs> the pl plastic ones full of goodies. And, and for all you environmentalists out there, because I am one too, we save these plastic eggs. We use them every year. So our story today, and this was not planned, is heaven according to kids. <laughs> and there are many authors of this book, too many to be named right now, but this is a media lab book that was the publisher. Heaven is all around us. You can find heaven at church or on a boat. That was from Evan, age six. You get your very own puppy, and it never grows up. And your puppy has a pet elephant. Isabella, age seven. It's a place where you can eat everything and anything that you want all the time and forever. <laughs> Brennan, age seven. Happy and sunny, Thomas, age eight. Everybody has a really cool car, like a monster truck or a fire truck or a race car, and you already know how to drive. Michael, age six. Every morning you wake up and find out it's a snow day. Jacob, age seven. <laughs> when you go to heaven... God carries your soul up in big buckets. Our cat went to heaven, and now he gets to scratch everything without getting yelled at. Amelia, age seven. Get me started on my cat. 
It's a place where anything can happen. Emma, age nine. Heaven is full of angels. When they're not busy playing games with their friends, they keep watch over people on earth. Kendall, age eight. We can walk on the ceiling with God in heaven. Dominic, age five. If heaven's in the sky, then there's no floor. So I guess people just float everywhere. Ava, age five. <clears throat> there are puppies and kitties everywhere in kids playing games. Joey, age five. Playing follow the leader with Jesus on streets made of gold. There's lots of birds and we get to play trains all day. <laughs> the end. Now we know what heaven is like. <laughs> okay, I'd like for all my children to come up to the front. come up you don't have to say anything if you don't want <laughs> okay so the kids are going to read the covenant with you and your covenant is in the order of service should be on the right hand side of the page love is the spirit of this church and service is its law this is our great covenant to dwell together in peace to seek the truth and love and to help one another and now there's a song that we sing every time that we leave. <laughs> and when we leave today, we're going to go out this door, okay? All right, out this door. All right. Okay. Ready? Go. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you. Everywhere, everywhere you may go. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you. Everywhere, everywhere you may go. Each and every month we share our non-pledge collection with an organization that is involved in making our community and UUYO a better place. This month we are sharing with the Minister's Fund, which provides for the needs of the parish and the broader community. We now receive the offering that sustains the life of this church and its work in the world. If you are visiting with us for the first or the second time, we invite you to let the plate pass, for you are our guest here, and you honor us with your presence. Will the greeters please come forward? Thank you. 
now invite you to take a moment of silent meditation together. Sit back in your pew. Bring those shoulders down about a quarter of an inch. Straighten the spine. Take a deep breath in, out. Mary Oliver, the tree at the entrance to Blackwater Pond. Every day on my way to the pond, I pass the lighting, felled, chesty, hundred-fingered black oak, which summers ago swam forward when the storm laid one lean yellow wand against it, smoking it open to its rosy heart. It dropped down in a veil of rain in a cloud of sap and fire, and became what it has been ever since, a black boat floating in the tossing leaves of summer, like the coffin of a series descending upon the cloudy Nile. But listen, I'm tired of that brazen promise, death and resurrection. I'm tired of hearing how the nitrogen will return to the earth again through the hinterland of patience, how the mushrooms and the yeast will arrive in the wind, how they will anchor the pearls of their bodies and begin to gnaw through the darkness like wolves at bones. What I loved, I mean, was that tree, tree of the moment tree of my own sad mortal heart. And I don't want to sing anymore for the way Osiris came home at last on a clean and powerful ship over the dangerous sea as a tall and beautiful stranger. Our second reading, also from Mary Oliver, The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, 
who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do not know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? under the sky how Jesus the Savior did come for to die for poor ordinary people like you and like I I wonder as I wander out under the sky When Mary birthed Jesus, t'was in a cow stall With wise men and farmers and shepherds and all. But high from God's heaven, a star's light did fall. And the promise of the ages, it then did. Jesus had wanted for any wee thing a star in the sky or a bird on the wing or all of God's angels in heaven for to sing he surely could have it cause he was the king I wonder as I wander out under the sky how Jesus, the Savior, did come for to die For poor, ordinary people like you and like I I wonder as I wonder
This is the adapted sermon from Reverend Andy Burnett. Pretend I'm him, if you could, for a minute. I saw a meme on social media last week with a cat smiling, pink and white and red flowers all around. And the words, which are edited now to be appropriate for Easter, quote, what a messed up time to be alive. And I thought, well, that's about right. Because just like in all times, like the kitten and the flowers, there's beauty to be found. The sunshine yesterday, the way this congregation buzzes with energy when you're together, such beauty. But wow, right alongside that, seriously, what a messed up time to be alive when a man with a gold laminated bathroom is hawking a Bible with American documents and lyrics from a Lee Greenwood song, whoa, that's messed up. It's like the poet William Blake wrote, joy and woe are woven together fine always. The gospel writers told the story in a particular way, using the vehicle of fable, a story with a meaning that goes beyond the details of the narrative itself. The authors intended to tell us that even when all seems hopeless, life persists. That there is some force active in the universe, a force which some call God, that prefers life to death. They knew, by the way, that they weren't writing a newspaper story, paraphrasing Jesus scholar J.D. Cross, and who could be blunt? He says, my point is not that those ancient people told little literal stories and we are now smart enough to take them symbolically, but that they told them symbolically, and we're dumb enough to take them literally. Like Crossan, I contend that the Jesus resurrection story was never intended by its original authors to be taken literally. And even without the assumption that Jesus came alive after being killed, stooped up and walked out of a tomb 2,000 years ago, even with that assumption, we can find inspiration in this parable. The truth at the root of the story is this. Life persists. Even in the face of death, life persists. Back to the text. A person might ask the question, what did the authors hope this story would accomplish? We've established it wasn't to convince people that the story happened in a newspaper true sort of way. The late Episcopal Bishop John Shelby Spong writes this, and I quote, There will be some who pretend that they do see, even when they do not. They will insist that they have concrete evidence, many of them will occupy high positions in ecclesiastical circles. But the proof of the vision, or lack thereof, will be seen in what happens in their lives. Do they become like Jesus, open, accepting, loving, and the feeders of the hungry of the world? Or do they become righteous, eager to enforce their understanding of truth on others, judging and rejecting those who, by their standards, are inadequate believers or inadequate human beings. But really and truly, friends, we can't gloss over it. What a messed up time to be alive. It's frightening. If I'm honest, I'm certainly not a scientist, but it appears we have crossed a line in our overuse of the earth. And we are not just going to escape some grave effects of climate change. As you know, we're already seeing and experiencing them. 
Timothy Beale is a professor of religion at Case Western. He wrote a book called When Time is Short, Finding Our Way in the Anthropocene. In it, Beale suggests that we're all in a kind of shock as we see climate change playing out and gradually come to realize that human life, as we know it, has a horizon. We don't know the timeline, and there's a lot that we can still do to avoid the very worst effects. But in this time of adjusting to the realization that climate change is escalating, many of us are struggling to even voice that feel. Does, Beale does a beautiful job of giving language to that lament. But that's not mostly what Beale's book is about. He goes on to invite us to reflect on how we will live in this daunting new knowledge. He reinterprets ancient scripture to suggest that even though we are challenging times, this can also be a time of settling into our communities, buying fewer things, rediscovering the beauty of the earth, getting to know people around us, sort of opting out of the consumerist mindset that has extracted the earth's resources as if they belong to us. He says it should be a time, too, of advocacy and protest and righteous indignation. I think Beale is saying in different words that in the fa face of death, life persists. At times, there may appear to be death, but they rise again. We see it in individual lives and in the lives of nations. Countries crushed under the oppressor's heel rise up to claim freedom and self-governance. Justice may be denied, delayed, twisted and corrupted, but it will rise again to be born anew in the hearts of people. Truth may be crushed by tanks, armadas, official silences, but it will live again as it is kindled in the hearts of men and women who will live by no other standard. Beauty is fragile. It may be surfaced over by highways or mass developments, but beauty rises to shine through the drive and tawdry and the ugly. Beauty cannot be killed. Love may be buried beneath selfishness, cruelty, arrogance, and hatred, but the stone will be rolled away and love will rise again to talk with us, inspire us. Courage may be imprisoned in the dank cells or the darkest tombs, but courage springs up anew in the hearts of all the oppressed. The power of human love to redeem human suffering and misery, to overcome fear and selflessness, to reach into the grave and beyond does not die. Beauty, truth, love, justice, courage, live and inspire others and redeem human life when they are manifest in us and truly risen in our lives. Some things will never die. At the end of his life, And if for you, hope is hard to find these days, please do not give up. Though times may be difficult, though all may sometimes be lost, hang on. Life persists. Resurrection can happen even on the worst of our days. May it be so for you. And now let us pray. Spirit of life and love, may we live in our lives in a spirit of compassion that we might leave the world a better place 
then we found it. Amen. And now, please rise as you are able for hymn number 203, All Creatures of the Earth and Sky. extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we keep in our hearts and share with all the world. May life bless you and keep you. May the Spirit make its face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the universe offer the fullness of its blessings to you and bring you peace. Go in peace, friends, and may we remember, even on our most challenging times, that resurrection is possible. Amen. Amen. <laughs>